Hi, this is Brent Ulenhop at Simplify ETFs, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today for Keeping It Simple, titled Dawson's Creek or One True Hill to Die On. We're going to be discussing what's really going on in today's economy, and believe me, there's plenty to discuss. As always, I'm joined by Mike Green and Harley Bassman, and today we are fortunate to have special guest Cameron Dawson, who is the Chief Investment Officer at New Edge Wealth. And uh, Cameron helps lead the development of New Edge Wealth's investment themes, strategies, and market views, while also working closely with the firm's advisors and clients. Prior to joining New Edge Wealth, Cameron was a chief market strategist at FieldPoint Private Securities and a senior equity analyst at Bank of America. Throughout her career, she has developed extensive experience in macroeconomics and implementing forward-thinking investment themes and asset allocation strategies. She is widely known for her differentiated and thoughtful financial commentary and frequently appears on Bloomberg, CNBC, and Fox Business, among others. Additionally, Cameron is a chartered financial analyst and a former board member of the CFA Society of Orlando. An impressive resume there. And just two quick housekeeping items. Uh, per usual, you can ask any questions to the panel by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to those uh, as this discussion progresses. And a friendly reminder that everything discussed today is for educational and informi informational purposes only and is not to be considered investment advice. Uh, with that out of the way, I'll turn it over to you, Mike. Fantastic. Brent, thank you very much. Cameron, it's great to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to uh, be here. It's a pleasure. I see Harley's here as well. Uh, <laughs> okay. He also ran. He also ran, exactly. So this is actually kind of a, you know, Cameron, you and I have uh, have talked a couple of times. We really met um, about a month and a half ago, two months ago in Florida. We had a fantastic conversation. One of the things that I wanted to explore is a topic both you and I have been struggling with, which is how accurate is the data that we're actually getting, right? So we know that, you know, we're supposed to receive the data. We know that the market reacts to the data. But this cycle has been characterized by an extraordinary amount of revisions to data. It's been characterized by a lot of confusing and what I would argue is broadly um, inconsistent reports that have come out, particularly on the employment side. So that was one of the areas that you and I were kind of talking about a little bit. The, 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 you were kind enough to prepare a presentation that kind of started actually with one of the charts that highlighted one of my charts. And so if we actually share that slide quickly. I want to start with that and then I want to come back and do our survey. So just very quickly, I'm going to share. There we go. There's our introduction. Dawson's Creek or one true hill to die on. And the slide that you had prepared for us, there we go, is looking at this purported strength in the U.S. economy. We've had the employees on non-farm payrolls start off 2024 with kind of a bang, right? We re-accelerated off of what was a clearly decelerating number. And we printed 300 plus, which feels kind of extraordinary in the context of what feels like an economy that's operating very close to full potential. Um, but some unusual stuff happened, right? So in particular, if we look at the difference between the establishment survey and the household survey, there was a really glaring exception, and that's in the full-time employment. You change. I had done this in an absolute number component. You changed it to a percentage of the labor force, as I understand it. Can you talk a little bit about how you would think about what's going on here and how you're thinking about this dynamic of the non-farm payrolls? Yeah, th this is on the absolute uh, component. That right-hand chart shows the the total uh, full-time employment on the year-over-year -year change, which was your observation, which I thought was so important, which is it is extraordinarily rare to see full-time employment deteriorate or dip into negative territory without experiencing a recession, whether it's happening while you're in a recession or deteriorating going into a recession. And the hard part, you know, I'd add to your how do we trust the data kind of rundown of all the different things, uh, which, you know, we think about, you know, poor survey responses, uh, all of the distortions from a seasonal standpoint um, to the data where, you know, if you look at that right hand chart, you know, I had to curtail, you know, the, the top and the bottom because it was just completely off the charts of what mm -hmm. happened during the pandemic. But I think that there's something broader there when we think about all of the data we've been experiencing 
from the pandemic and the messages that it's sending, which is that there is still so much distortion from these wild swings um, in the data that we're getting these echo effects that when we think about how do we determine if a series is going down, uh, for example, how do we differentiate between something that's just normalizing from these distortions versus outright weakening? And one of the things you and I talked about yesterday, Mike, which was that there's a lot of things that we could talk about jolts and maybe some temporary workers that could be falling into normalization, but maybe not quite weakening yet. This is the one, the full-time employment going negative is the one it's really hard to explain away um, as being just a normalization and not a sign of something weaker brewing under the surface. So Cameron, th didn't they address that last week by saying they were miscounting the uh, immigrants? So that's part of the claim, right? So there was an article that proposed that that was one of the underlying dynamics. And the hypothesis was that the payroll survey, which surveys establishments, just to orient everyone to the conversation here, and, and, and I want to hit on a couple of these components that Cameron raised as well. But the question is, are employers doing a better job of reporting employees or are households doing a better job of reporting employees? And there's the criticism of the household survey is how could the census possibly get in touch with these individuals or the BLS more accurately, get in touch with these individuals who have come into the country illegally this is, you know, one of these really interesting questions. Do we think that the non-farm payroll number is more accurate or the household number is more accurate? I retreat to the fact that every time we look at revisions, and in particular, I'd highlight the quarterly census on employment and wages, that has materially reduced the numbers that we're seeing from the non-farm payrolls. So when we actually do survey the underlying data, we find that, Q, that, that the non-fam payrolls have significantly overstated. I shared a chart a couple of weeks ago on my Substack that highlighted the dynamics around California, which literally had reported fantastic employment growth, and it turned out none of it actually happened, right? Um, so we've got some really interesting components here. I, I would suggest that if any state didn't know how to count people properly, it's probably California. Um, but that would be my response to that question, Harley. What, Cameron, how would you respond to that? Yeah, look, I think that that I I would agree with what you said. I haven't d dug into the details to the to the magnitude that you have. I mean, it's it's possible that this is just a blip. Um, and we've certainly seen blips in the wrong direction. Whether it's it's even in some of the survey work where that where they were misleading for one or two months. If you go back, even like look at the NFIB from a couple of months ago that showed hiring intentions really yep. spiked higher and wage intentions spiked higher and then fell off um, rather materially in a few months later. So you know, it's very likely that this could be a blip, but I think that that that's why kind of the last sentence is that is saying that if this jobs data is actually weakening under the surface, we should see it in things like demand. And I think that's the proof of everything that you're talking about, Mike, which is that if it actually is weaker than the data is saying, we should see it in how people are spending money. And if we're starting to see a bigger deceleration in how people are spending money, then I think your thesis will be proven correct. If we're still seeing people spend and retail sales holding up a lot better and personal consumption holding up a lot better, uh, maybe some of the, it's it you know it's some of the strength is real and it's a little bit more in between. So I, I definitely think that's a critical underlying component, and I would also highlight Harley. So take a look at the chart on the left hand side because I think this really speaks even the non farm payrolls really speaks to the dynamic that Ka that Cameron was highlighting, which is is it slowing or is it normalizing, right? And so this, you know, one interpretation of the chart on the left-hand side, which is looking at the absolute number of non-farm payrolls, is that it couldn't possibly sustain, sustain itself at the 900 or million sort of level, and therefore it was naturally going to normalize, that that could be confused as decelerating as compared to normalization, and now we've kind of settled into a higher, more stable framework. Um, that, that may be true. Right. I mean, this is the hard part. We genuinely actually don't know what the underlying data is, which is almost exactly the point that I think we're making, which is this is a very confusing time period for developed market economists. 
because we just can't actually trust the data that we're seeing. It's incongruous with so much other stuff. I'll show a chart later on that looks at the underlying dynamics of um, even the unemployment data, which has generally been quite favorable, has its own little wrinkles in it that um, are a function of the very rapid change in the demographics of our employment, of our labor force, where we've switched from old people to younger people as the baby boomers begin to move out. We've switched from those with less than college graduate degrees to those with college graduate degrees. They have very different behaviors within the labor force. And normalizing that and thinking about it from a demographic standpoint, we did a little bit of work going into the events of COVID talking about you know, how would we demographically adjust labor force participation, et cetera. We just haven't had the time or really, I would argue, the, the ability to focus in an in a environment in which a lot of pieces are moving on what is that actual demographic adjustment look like. So like the quick answer is I would argue that, that we don't know. And that's actually a really, that's part of the reason this is such an interesting time period. That actually gives us a perfect opportunity to bring in the survey. So the first survey question, let's put it up there. Okay, there we go. Will the, uh, we're gonna do all three at the same time. Okay, so will the 10 year close above 5% before year end? Yes or no choice. Second question is, will the core CPI print 2.9% year over year or lower before year end? The December report for the November time period, just to be clear. So no cheating and, and bleeding into January as I did last year. Uh, will SPX breach 4364 before year end? That would be a 50% retracement from the October 22 lows. Uh, once again, a choice, yes or no. This is actually a really interesting one because we've seen a number of Wall Street strategists. Cam, I don't know if you have a, a target number on the S&P 500, but I know that we've seen basically everybody on the street start to revise their numbers dramatically higher because nobody really feels comfortable as a you know uh, upright mammal in separating from the herd. Yeah, I think the only uh, real bear left is Marco uh, at JP Morgan, who I think has of 4,600 price target, which is effectively your 200 day moving average. Yeah. And if you think about his thesis for that price target, it's one where earnings come in a little bit less than expected, expected and valuations revert back to some kind of more normal territory. There's interesting kinds of, of assumptions behind that. The one, you know, the thing to remember about earnings is you're always going to price in the next year earnings numbers, mm -hmm. which means that if you look at earnings for 2025, right now they're sitting at about 273 a share. That implies 6% revenue growth and a, a jump to 17% operating margins, which is a massive jump higher to new all-time high. So I would imagine that if we were to see bigger, Economic or market volatility, it could really kick in the second half of the year if you start marking down those twenty-five numbers, because that's when you'll start pricing pricing it in. So I think that's a really critical point, and I know a number of people are familiar with this. I wish we actually had a slide that shows this, but this margin number is really the key question, right? So if we go back and we look at two thousand and the extraordinary valuations that were achieved at that point. We were, if I remember correctly, running about a 5% operating mar uh, net margin in terms of earnings per share relative to a price to sales for the S&P 500. That reflected the incredible amounts of investment that were occurring, et cetera. And today, as Cameron is pointing out, the way I think about it is as a percentage of gross value added, we're just so far off the charts the, the idea that we're going to push higher seems very hard to me, but that's really been the pattern for the past decade is, is, you know, bumping up against that margin number and pushing beyond it. The interesting thing about margins is that they love inflation. Mm -hmm. Margins really do like higher prices. So if you go back to the COVID period, pre-COVID period, for 2013 through about 20, early 2020, you stuck in a 13 to 14% range on the operating margin for the S&P 500. You kind of had some bumps and oscillations, you know, uh, margins fell during the 2015 industrial recession, et cetera. During COVID, they skyrocketed to over 16% because of pricing power, because revenues were growing at, they grew at a peak of 17 and a half percent. 
on a year over year basis. Margins love pricing power because it flows right through to the bottom line. It doesn't actually matter on the cost front. It's that revenue on the contribution margin. It's all about incremental margin dynamics. So margins fell last year, not because revenues fell and we were having some deep recession. They fell because revenue growth was normalizing from 17.5% to about 5%. Mm-hmm. And so that normalization meant that margins fell to about 13 and a half percent. So when I put that then in the context of 25, where the street has seven, a, a, a jump to 17 percent margins, that's that's really interesting because you're effectively saying it's all productivity. It's not going to come because revenues soared, but we're going to get some productivity miracle that gets us there. Yeah, I, I definitely think that's. True. I think there, there's an element of that. I think there's also part of it, and I have not done the bottoms up analysis to support this. I don't know if you have. Part of it is a composition component where, you know, as NVIDIA grows like mad, it becomes a larger and larger portion of it. And I know you've actually done some work around this in which, you know, you're highlighting, and it's the same thing I'm highlighting, that the Russell 2000, for example, shows none of this improvement. If anything, it looks like it's going the opposite direction. You mentioned the NFIB small business looks like, I think the technical term is ass, right? Um, It's just ridiculously bad. The numbers that we're seeing in terms of the NFIB surveys that are coming in from Bill Dunkelberg and the crew over there about how small business is doing. And that that's one of the areas, those who have have paid attention to what I write and talk about this stuff. It's been a real frustration for me because the large companies are very well uh, equipped to handle much higher interest rates it's the local mom and pop that needs that line of credit to replace the pizza oven that is getting absolutely slaughtered in this environment. It's really, really a challenging environment for small business. As I put it on my sub stack, you know, go out and find your local small businessman and give them a hug um, or businesswoman. It doesn't matter. But um, OK, so let's let's hit our poll. Will the 10 year close above 5 percent? Harley, we are straight down the middle. I don't think we've ever seen this before. This actually helps to explain an awful lot of the rate volatility that we're seeing. Basically, half the people agree with you and are wrong, and half the people agree with me and are right. Um, This is kind of nuts. We are literally split right down the center. This is really incredible. I've never seen this before. Um, Half the people above 2.9 on CPI. A slightly higher fraction believes that the market will not retreat to 43.64. This is actually really, this is an interesting survey. Nice work, Carly. You pulled this one together. I'm going to have to give you kudos for putting up some interesting questions. Um, Cameron, what's your reaction to this? I mean, the 50-50 split is certainly interesting on the on the yield front. And I think, yeah. um, you know, we we came into the year expecting yields to be biased a lot higher uh, than we, where they started the year. I, you know, I don't know if we close quite above 5%, but we're certainly going to try. Um, and maybe if you ask this at 4.75, it'd be interesting to see what the answer would be. Um, because we think that that's a 4.75 to 5% um, is certainly in play. Yeah. I, uh, so I'm sympathetic to that. Those who, again, Harley and I talk about this all the time. You know, the idea that we need to reestablish term premium, which is a term that a lot of people use and kind of toss out there as if it is, you know, something quite sophisticated. Um, The simple reality is this term premium is just the compensation for the risk that the path of interest rates would be higher in the future than you currently receive. Right. So the easiest way to think about it is I should pay a slight premium for a 10 year bond relative to a two-year bond or to a three-month bond because I have uncertainty about the path of interest rates. Now, the irony is, is over the 40-year bull market that we experienced in rates, we continually outperform those expectations. And so there's a muscle memory component that's almost perfectly described by those charts that we all see about the Fed's forecast for interest rates and how they were perennially high or the street forecast, how they were perennially high. This to me is actually just a really interesting testament of how much the environment has changed where suddenly 450 on the tens. I'm shocked that a lot of people look at that and they're like, wow, that's really low. That should be a lot higher. That feels like that's the wrong number. Now I'm used to that from Harley because mostly he's wrong on these things, but 
that's just uh, that's really surprising to me that that the audience is is there. You know, Mike, I, I was going to ask you to remind me: are, are you either child of my of my brother or my sister? Well, I, I, I'm I'm the ugly, uh, slightly red tinted stepchild of your sister. Because yeah, I was curious when you're going to cry, Uncle. I. <laughs> well said, Harley. I, I have to confess, I have cried uncle numerous times, mostly Never. because of the duress of, of having an opinion on rates that they could possibly move lower. Uh, we've got about two and a half minutes of, of relief starting in October of last year, and that was about it. Um, okay, let's let's close out the survey and let's move on to the next one. One second of here. Cameron, I, the 10 year nice don't care. What do you think about the two year note? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's all the action, man. Yeah. Well, I mean, isn't it interesting that in reaction to the PPI data today, the two year backed off slightly, a little bit, took a tiny breather, but tens and thirties were higher. Yeah. I mean, does that like is that not somewhat of a reflection that maybe I mean, I'm not trying to read too much into one day's trading, but that if the Fed were to be tolerant of higher inflation. Does that not suggest that our our long run rate should be higher at the same time is that we probably at this year's Jackson Hole will be talking about the long run neutral rate a little bit more. And at two and a half percent, does it make sense, given the fact that Fed funds rate has been double that if for quite some time in the entire time of that, the, the economy is growing technically above trend um, on the two year you know, it's the technically it looked it like kept trying to break above its overhead resistance on the it was the 200 day moving average. I'm pulling it up right now. It broke firmly above that. I wouldn't be surprised that it takes a little bit of a breather, but the trend is up and the trend is up suggests that you're higher for longer. At least that's the dominant narrative. I would say, though, the two year will remain volatile because one bad NFP, uh, uh, non-firm payrolls data, one soft inflation print, and a lot of this move is reversed. Seller. I think that the Fed can't take rates up for all the variety of reasons, and they can't take rates down either anymore. I mean, basically because after next month, they can't move. You have the conventions going on. You have three meetings that are basically locked in. Maybe they could squeeze one number into uh, uh, in, in June. And then I guess the next one is the day after the election in November. I, I think it's, it's one and done. I think you can stick a fork in the bottom market. I, I think I think we're, we found our level in the front end and it's over. And now the back end, we got to then kind of fish that out. But also I think the, I think back end volatility is, is kind of done. I, I really think that we're kind of be pinned for the, for the next six months here. And it's the stock market we have no idea about. Mike, have you, have you looked at... For every 25 basis point cut in the Fed funds rate, what it does to reduce Treasury interest payments going forward? I haven't done the math on it, but we can, I mean, we could very quickly back into it, right? We know that we got somewhere in the neighborhood of $33 trillion worth of total debt. And so a 25 basis point play is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of $60 billion, right? I mean, that's a lot of money when you stop to think about it. I was, I ran through the math. You know, and if you look at the the budget, there's an awful lot of discussion around the idea that you know we've got spending gone wild in the U.S. government. The interesting thing to me is is that the primary deficit is actually retreated quite significantly. We're in the two and change range on the primary deficit, and it's all about rates at this point. And Cameron, that brings up a point, and I'm going to, uh, you know, kind of go out of order here and show a few slides that you shared otherwise, that is a discussion that you and I had offline that is very similar to discussions I have with Warren Mosler on a regular basis, which is this idea that the hike in interest rates actually proved income supportive, at least in its initial phases. Can you talk a little bit about that while I pull up a few slides that you, you created on this? Yeah, this is the great paradox of living in a world after huge amounts of quantitative easing that suppress long end bond yields in a way that we hadn't seen in any other recovery cycle. And that suppression reached its beaver pitch in 2020 
when, oh, I lost my, I lost my light. There we go. Well, it turns out if you buy, if you buy a cheap ring light, it's going to die. Um, so now I live, I live in a realm of dark darkness. Um, so hopefully not, not too bad. So, so we saw, we saw a massive refinancing wave in 2020 and 2021. If you look, the high yield index, two thirds of the issuance of the high yield index was done to refinance. You saw this huge um, um, amount of volume of people locking and loading in higher or low rates for an extended period of time. That effectively has dulled the impact of not just business balance sheets that were able to do that kind of lending, but consumer balance sheets that were able to do that type of lending as well with mortgages, where as you've seen rates back up, those kind of borrowers, the ones that were able to lock in rates, saw their cash interest payments spike higher with you know, now we're yielding at over 5%, but did not see a concomitant increase in their interest expense. So the end result is in aggregate, the net interest expense in the economy fell last year despite the hiking cycle. This has never happened in prior hiking cycles. Usually what you see is Fed hikes and you see that interest expense go higher, meaning interest costs outweigh the benefits of higher interest income. But certainly that's not what happened this time around. And we think the key reason is just because we have never seen such a massive suppression what not just in the US, but globally of long end bond yields, you know, the, the, the tenure reached 0.5% in the summer of 2020. It's it, you know, important to remember just how low yields were. And so the question going forward is, you know, what happens when that debt has to be refinanced in the high yield market, usually average maturity is in that five to seven year range. So you're starting to get maturities come up in a more meaningful way in 2025. Obviously, even if the Fed cuts a little bit, you're going to see a big uptick in the interest expense for those that have to refi. There are certainly companies that that borrowed at 30 years you know, plus during 2020 and 2021, so they won't be as impacted. But then the other interesting catch, and I think this is the one where you know it seems very paradoxical, which is that if the Fed starts cutting short-term interest rates, but your long interest rates where you're refining at stay high or go higher you could actually see this net interest cost go up significantly as the Fed is cutting rates, which is also paradoxical because you're earning less on your cash, but you're still having to refinance at higher rates, which that's where you know you say something heretical, which is that rate cuts could actually be restrictive. Oh, you're on mute, Mike. Still on mute. There we go. So Harley, this is this is the thought process of Warren and I'm Mosler. As, as, there we go. This this is the thought process of Warren Mosler as well. And I shared Cam's chart, the aftermath of QE, net interest expense falls during a rate cycle. Um, you know, th there's a couple of things that I would would highlight here. One is is that this is, you know, this in a Keynesian framework, and there's no offense there, Cameron. I just want to be very clear, uses an aggregate. So what we're really doing here is we're blending all the local pizza shops who are borrowing at Prime Plus, and we are comparing them against effectively Microsoft, right? I've used this example any number of times where I, I highlight that effectively it's, you know, Bill Gates and I walk into a bar, can be a totally average bar, and the bartender says, oh, look, a couple of billionaires, right? Um, that was a joke, get it, the average bar? <laughs> anyway, the, uh, the, the, the point is, is that the aggregate is actually quite different. And so I think this is part of what we're seeing in the NFIB reports, in which it's just like they're telling us that the cost of financing for the average NFIB reporter, uh, respondent who borrows is now north of 9%, right? So they are really facing a dramatic change in their borrowing costs. At the same time, I think about my personal behavior where suddenly like I got my report from for my uh, 1099 from my bank and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm I, I have to report all this income. Right. All of a sudden, there's a lot of money there that wasn't there before. Uh, Harley, how do you think about this dynamic? The the difference between what we're experiencing on the income side and the termed out debt that we're seeing on the kind of liability side? 
I, I was kind of distracted by bringing up Warren, the godfather of MMT, and the idea that printing money doesn't matter, uh, using him as a, as a base, base case, but I'll ignore that small detail. Um, I, I, look, I, 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 I think uh, the bigger context here is that is 5% restrictive on the economy. And um, I don't see how you say it. it's not. I mean, I, I think a lot of what's going on here is people are, are, you know, kind of locked into the last 10 years and they view that as history and they forgot the previous, you know, gazillion years. 5% was not the wrong number for, for most of post-World War II. Uh, so this idea that the Fed's restrictive at 5%, it's, it's just they stopped printing money. Um, so uh, I, I'm not bothered by any of this stuff at all. And the question is, are we going to get any kind of slowdown in the economy that's interesting? Mike, you're, you're, you're falling off. Um, I, th I think the answer is no. I think, I think the Fed's not restrictive over here. I think they're going to stay where they are. Um, I think the other idea that, you, that, that you've hit on is correct, though that we do have a, a bimodal situation where the bottom 20, 30, 40, 60% of people are, are suffering or at least struggling and the upper 10, 20, 30, 40 are doing just fine, which of course is the whole problem of why we're where we are politically because um, you know the QE uh, benefited people who own assets and people who own assets right now are, uh, well, you know, boomers and the boomers are spending. Uh, so that's chugging us along. I mean, can the lower half a portion of the economy can that you know cause a problem for us? I I don't know. Well, I mean, I, not, not in the aggregate it can't, but individually can it? Yeah. I still I yeah I wouldn't I wouldn't write off small business troubles as as not being able to impact the aggregate for a few reasons. The first one is they're big employers. I don't remember the stats off the top of my head about how much you know the the classically defined small business is an employer in the U.S. Uh, but at the same time, they're also customers of all these bigger companies. And so if the pain is intense enough, then in theory, you would expect them to pull back on certain spending and CapEx. And so it's, you know, if, if we're in an ecosystem where we all are reliant on each other, to a certain extent, yes, the large companies, you know, look at a company like Meta, you know, now it's just swimming in all this cash because it doesn't have much debt and it's all termed out and it has huge cash balances. Um, and yet it is 98% advertising. Yeah, but if we have, you know, the bulk of the economy is small business and let's just dump them into this group of people who are struggling. If they're struggling such that it's a problem, why are we not seeing it? in the employment data. I mean, wouldn't that be the first place for it to show up? That, that's where we started, Harley. We're not sure whether we're seeing it in the data or not, right? So we've seen an absolute spike. I mean, one of the data sets that has come to light in just the past couple of days is, is the fear amongst the, those in the bottom half, right? Those who have lower income levels of losing their job in the next couple of months has absolutely exploded. I don't have the chart, unfortunately, but we're starting to see these rise quite dramatically. I'll cheat and share the chart. Let's see here. There we go. Oh. Let me show the chart that I was going to highlight. So this is actually looking at, this is looking at what I was talking about, breaking the, um, the numbers down into individual types of employees, right? So here we're looking at age groups, 16 to 19, 25 to 54, 20 to 24, I'm sorry, that's out of order, and 55 plus. And it, like, these are very different demographic groups, right? So the 16 to 19, if you've got tons of 16 to 19 year olds in your economy, almost by definition, you're going to have different employment characteristics in aggregate than you are when you don't. Likewise, if you have an economy that is heavily dominated by the 25 to 54, you should be experiencing lower unemployment because that's the group that actually is the core of the labor market that is both participating and very much tied into it, right? Those over the age of 55 or even more so over the age of 65 are somewhat, um, you know, I, I would say discretionary participants in the labor force. They either have to do it and they're a Walmart greeter, which sucks, I think is the technical term for it. Um, or they're for, you know, or they're choosing not to participate, right? And so it can be very, very different. This is Z-scoring, so effectively taking the distribution for each individual age group 
and then adjusting the current reported data for that z-score and what we're seeing and once again just looks exactly like a recession and I'm, we are seeing elevated unemployment by group i'm not going to beat up on you more than necessary but oh, please do i'm kind of into months, it look you rosie snyder lacy have all been calling for armageddon which hasn't happened we've all been saying to go and buy you know 30 year zeros bad idea I think the question is this, and Cameron, I'll toss this to you. Where I think the meets the road is demographics and specifically boomers. And Mike has gone on at length finding good studies so that as you become a geezer, you spend less, and thus there should be less spending and less economy. I propose that we're going to get more spending because as the geezers, that's me, boomers, retire we have this massive wealth of real estate, gold, art, stock, everything, and we're going to go and spend it. And our spending patterns will be different than prior demographic profiles of geezers. And so that's where I think the rubber meets the road is, is we boomers are retiring. So we're taking us out of supply of labor, but we're still spending or even spending more because we have the money to go and do it. And so that's I'll propose that as the demographic you know, fulcrum. Cameron, do you have a thought on that? Yeah. And I think if you look, I think it's very interesting and mostly given the assumption that when people think about the three horsemen of, of deflation or disinflation that happened uh, post a great financial crisis or really, let's let's say disinflation uh, starting in the in the late or sorry, the early 80s. People will say you know, technology and they'll say globalization and they'll say demographics. And the demographics one has always been a peculiar one because they just reference Japan and they say, well, as Japan aged, they had deflation. So, of course, as other economies age, you're going to get deflation. And we've seen, you know, kind of a, a microcosm of what happens when Old, in the US, this older generation, which has wealth and has the propensity to spend, um, that when they retire and exit the labor force, you get upward pressure on on wages because of the exit of the labor force, arguably, maybe, you know, maybe not directly, but that obviously was part of some of the tightness that we've seen over the last couple of years as well as these consumers that are now with 5% cash yields, you know, feeling like they have a, a bunch of money burning a hole in their pocket. So I, I, I don't, I wouldn't write off that, um, uh, that thesis. And the only thing I'd add to it is that because of the massive amount of wealth generation that's happened over the last 50 years, you're dealing with bigger and bigger numbers as things have, if, if are now exponential. And so, you know, a return that would typically be 7%, let's say 7, 8% on a certain amount of money, that same 7 to 8% generates that much more money um, that can then be spent. And I think it's why you're seeing such resilience in real estate prices and, and look at at housing prices on coastlines, you know, you've you've reached this inflection point of exponential growth of wealth for those that have it, uh, you know, given the the return backdrop. So it sounds like you're not in the rate cut camp or big rate cut camp. No, I look our our view. I my, my view stays the same, which is that that until there is glaring much more, more distinct data that the labor market is is outright weakening um uh you know, and, and that we have an, a bad nfp print given the fact that inflation is stickier and that financial conditions are at their easiest level since the peak in 2021 they've come in a little bit that there isn't much urgency to move to cut rates but I would argue that the the bar for flipping to rate cuts is far lower than the bar for keeping rates high and even raising them, which just means that the Fed is going to have a much quicker trigger finger in the in the response to weaker data than they will if we get this hot data, as we've seen over the last three months, right? Inflation data coming in better than expected, and they, and they keep going, yeah, but we think we're, we can cut. We think we can cut. Not, not Notwithstanding that it's bad public policy to ever talk about politics or religion um, to, with people, and, and I don't want you to say who you're thinking, uh, who you're going to vote for, who you might think is going to win, but seeing as- The flying spaghetti monster, come on. I, I was, I was going to say, this is where Harley comes out as Zoroastrian. That's uh, 
We're when Rastafarian. You, we're Rastafarian. There we go. The next six or seven. <laughs> How do you view the politics impacting any of the markets going forward in terms of what people are going to think? I I I think that I think I view it as the Fed's paralyzed and can't move because of it right now. Who's who's better for the economy? Um, I mean, either one of these geezers. I have no idea. You know, we were all surprised in sixteen when the market exploded up Trump. So I don't guess on that. But I, I, we we are in the once every four years window right now, and I'm curious um, if you have thoughts on that for your clients or or in general. My most salient thought, uh, because. I think there's a lot of wild cards. We don't know what, you know, what Trump is going to do with tariffs. Um, we don't know, you know, Biden election priorities. It's not like we've had a debate. But the one thing that neither party is running on at this point is austerity or balanced budgets. And we can debate if austerity or balanced budgets is something that they, you know, should pursue at different times and when it's good, when it's bad. However, what it effectively signals is that we should get used to higher deficits and that the treasury should get used to higher deficits. Treasury markets will have to get used to higher deficits. And then we can start having conversations of what does that mean for long and bond yields? Does it matter? Does treasury supply matter? Yeah, we freak out every now and again with the treasury refunding announcement, but you know, there's there's always been buyers, but neither party is talking about about cuts in fact they're all talking about even more deficit spending whether it's tax cuts um or you know, or, or more spending so you're not going to get it from revenues and you're not going to get spending cuts which would just say is that you have to kind of assume that the deficits will continue and the treasury market has to get comfortable with that the flip side of that i would just would just highlight very quickly is is that what we haven't actually seen yet is what traditionally has reinforced the inflationary dynamics is when the federal government or state governments, federal government really in particular, decides to hike pay a lot, right? And that tends to be the primary driver of the inflations that we see around wars, where the government says, we need to attract a whole bunch of labor, we call them soldiers, right? And we're going to hike wages to levels that make the private sector largely uncompetitive, right? In general, recruitment efforts tend to have relatively high nominal components. We certainly saw this throughout the period at the beginning of the 20th century and then the 1940s and then in the 1960s, et cetera, and into the even into the 1970s. I think one of the most interesting things is we just haven't seen it this time at all. Right. In fact, those in the federal government employment, and I know that nobody wants to hear this, but they're actually, I think the cumulative uh, wage hikes that we've seen from the federal government is only in the magnitude of about 12 to 13 percent over the past four years. So about half what we've actually seen on the inflation front. If, if I were to see the federal government start turning around and saying we have to raise wages in order to attract really competent employees, or we need to dramatically increase recruitment into the military, which has struggled, then I would really start to change my opinion. But the weird thing is, as much money as we're spending, it's really non-discretionary in its construction, other than, of course, the interest rate, which doesn't feel discretionary, but very much is, right? That's a choice by Jay Powell. On, on the flip side of that, Harley, I just want to highlight for you, like, for all the gangbuster that we're theoretically going, you know, I, I jokingly refer to this chart as why are rate hikes so resilient to the economy when most people are thinking about it in the opposite direction. But this is looking at industrial production, which has actually been falling. Right. So, the you know, this is an absolute decline alongside rising unemployment metrics, et cetera. We're seeing a net decline. We've seen auto sales and auto production stagnate even after we solve the quote unquote semiconductor component. And the yeah. last thing I would just highlight on, on the orange line is a decline. The orange line is declining. Yes. It, it, it kinda, I kind of can't see it that clearly. Okay. Again. Well, Harley, that's age. Okay. And second derivatives do matter. Yeah. Second derivatives do matter. Thank you. Um, the, 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 you know, to me, this is part of what's so fascinating is, is that we have a narrative that I would largely argue is a function of the performance of the stock market that says the economy is going gangbusters, but industrial production is falling, unemployment is rising, 
Um, inflation has fallen dramatically, even if you're not comfortable with where it is today. And in fact, if I look at the PCE component of inflation, which is what the Fed is supposed to theoretically be tracking, those really haven't seen the same bounce that we've seen in the CPI data. Admittedly, we will get another report. It is likely to rise a little bit. But what's happening in the CPI stuff, Harley, we talked about this, you know, to a, to a certain extent, is that we're seeing things like um, um, uh, motor vehicle insurance has spiked 22% year over year, reflecting those car prices that have increased, as well as higher elements of fraud, et cetera. What to me is so interesting about that is if you drive a car, you have to get car insurance. And so that increase in auto prices then manifests itself as an increase in cost of servicing clients. On the insurance side, they hike interest rates in what is largely a regulated business or hike insurance rates in what's largely a regulated business. But hiking interest rates doesn't actually increase demand for autos, it lowers demand for autos. So it feels to me like what we're seeing is this final kind of echo of inflation. Now, I could be totally wrong, but it does feel like at least the segments of the inflation that continue to persist are increasingly um, non-propagate, you know, do, no, do not propagate is the word that I was looking for there, right? Non-propagative? I'm not sure that's a phrase. Doesn't work as Scrabble. Cameron, I'm looking at the, the big- Can I just add just one, one, like one just really interesting sure. thing about the dynamics of the last- let's call it three years, which I don't know, Mike, if you have the, the chart about GDP uh, forecast revisions that I sent over, that I think the most fascinating thing has been this V-shape in growth expectations for, you could call it for 23 as well for 24. Um, yeah, I think it's the first the first chart in, in that a grouping because it speaks to what you're talking about, Mike, about interest rate sensitive sectors, which is that they all slowed really sharply in, in 22 um, in anticipation of growth being weaker. And so you, you can see over the course of 22, analysts really cut their forecasts significantly for 2023 growth and for 2024 growth. But it was the anticipation that Fed that rate hikes would hurt the economy. And if you think about it in the terms of things like IPO market shutting down, uh, venture capital having issues in 2022, you know, the, the liquidity was, was starting to dry up, but it was the anticipation that the mm -hmm. Fed hikes would hurt. And I think the interesting dynamic that's happened over the last, let's call it six months, is that the anticipation has now gone in the other direction, that the Fed is going to ease policy. And that happened a little bit in the housing market where you started to see people coming back in. You've seen an uptick in adjustable rate mortgages, people saying, yeah, I'll get a more, an adjustable rate today because it's going to get cut and we'll, I'll refi when it's lower if I, you know, it'll, it'll fall. Um, or even going into a fixed rate today saying I'll refi. So I, I think, and I keep coming back to it, I think that this 20, this right chart might be the most important chart to watch, which is that if we start to see evidence of some of the things you're seeing, Mike, and you start to see that shift into lower growth forecasts, that's when you get an actual risk-off move in equity markets. But as long as those growth forecasts stay stable and are either flat or are rising, I think that's the key reason why markets have been able to shrug all of these concerns off because you're you're recalibrating back to where you were before you anticipated that the Fed was going to ruin the party. The last point in that is that the Fed will eventually ruin the party. It's just it's taking a lot longer because of all the dynamics we talked about with the duration of that, the maturity of balance sheets. So when that refinancing comes, it's almost like the boy who cried wolf scenario, which is that you know, you you cry wolf, you cry wolf, you say the recession's coming, recession's coming, and then people go, no, I breathe a sigh of relief. And that's when the wolf comes to the to the village and starts eating people. Uh, and, you know, that's where people are caught flat footed, they're overstaffed, they're over inventoried, and that's your classic recession. Yeah, I, I, so I very much share that. I, I very much share that underlying view. I have been surprised that it's taken as long as it has. I would, I would highlight one of your charts that I actually think is... Um, that, that speaks to elements of that. And this is one that I've shared broadly as well, which is this issue of high yield in particular, right? And so if I look at what's happened in high yield, uh, 
even as the spreads in high yield are approaching the tightest levels we've ever seen, we really haven't seen any significant refinancing, right? This has been a period of time. And what we're looking at here on this chart, just to orient people, this is the weighted average maturity in number of years for high yield bonds. And so this tends to tighten. I often will show this with the global financial crisis time period in there as well, because we saw the same underlying dynamic of a failure to refinance as we went through that last hiking cycle from Greenspan, in which he hiked 25 basis points, 25 basis points, et cetera. That played out in the real estate market as a high degree of comfort in buying homes using adjustable rate mortgages. Cam was referring to this before. But the flip side of that was that you also saw corporations not refinance their debt. And then all of a sudden the recession hit and their operating performance deteriorated and the credit spreads blew out, making it almost impossible. Um, so I, I, I do kind of think that is the point that I would, would continually point to and highlight for people as they say, credit conditions have eased a lot. We are seeing a lot of investment grade companies, the largest, most stable companies successfully refinance, push and term out. I had another chart that actually shows the weighted average maturity for investment grade bonds is actually lengthening as it's shortening for high yield. It very much just speaks of this have and have not in society right now. Uh, we had a question, we had an observation from uh, one of our listeners that maybe Powell just wants to see the world burn. I don't actually think, by the way, that that's a terrible thought process, because I do think that part of what may be going on, and we're seeing elements of this, I thought, you know, there's, there's always the questions like, what is the most interesting thing that you've seen in the last week? One of the most interesting things I saw was, Cam, I don't know if you caught this, Harley, I doubt you were paying attention, but, the, um, but KKR actually issued a billion dollar NAV loan against a 2016 um, vintage fund, right? Now stop and think about that because uh, a PE fund is only supposed to be about 10 years in total life, right? And so what they did was they went and issued a billion dollar loan against the accumulated equity value of a fund that should theoretically be winding down and paying out right now. And the use was not distributions, right? The use was actually for operating purposes, financing purposes, et cetera. That tells me there's no liquidity out there, right? They are, this is the equivalent of saying, um, geez, you know, uh, I really like my cheap mortgage, but I'm going to refinance because it'll allow me to take out some equity in my home that I desperately need because I'm just short of cash, right? I've got to pay off my credit card debt at 22, 25, 30%. Therefore, it makes sense to give up my super attractive mortgage. I thought that was the most, that, like to me, I'm actually writing about it on my Substack this weekend. That to me was by far the most interesting piece of news I saw yeah. all week. I mean, because you know what we've heard from a lot of these private credit deals is that in order to refi, there's this requirement to add more equity. For, yes. you know, so when they all talk about how the underlying portfolio companies are doing great and how you know interest coverage, yeah, you know, it's not as good as it was, but it's really not bad. Um, and then you you go and you you can see that that there's you know, that there's desire for more equity. The weird thing that's happening though is because there's been so much flow into that part of the market, you've actually seen spreads come in materially for private credit spreads. So meaning that there's more risk, and yep. there's more demands. And in order to avoid, they're taking less spread in order to avoid having to give up covenants. And if that's not late cycle, I don't know what is. I'm with you, Cam. I I, I definitely, and I, I also would just highlight that you know, when we think about things like financial conditions and how we measure them and how we report them, it's always important for people to understand that there's a marginal line type dynamic, right? So coming out of the global financial crisis, what do we build our financial conditions indices to focus on? Credit spreads. Why? Because, well, that's where it happened last time, right? We effectively build a insulation that prevents the Germans from coming in on our Eastern front, right? Um, or in through other areas. And so what do they end up doing? They just go around it, right? Um, or up and over it too. Up and over it to be more precise, right? Um, you know, that type of dynamic, I think is actually really interesting in this concept, context. 
Because to me, all the risk actually has occurred not from the widening of spreads, but from the dramatic increase in risk-free rates, right? And almost no mechanism, no you know, uh, risk metrics actually include the change in the level of risk-free rates. Well, and and so, but the, and that's what's so interesting in with that average maturity, right? Is yep. like the reason why spreads are coming in is you know maybe it's partially because people are feeling more sanguine about the economy and all of that, and you haven't seen a hit to income, but it's also a supply and demand factor. You you, you see falling you see falling uh, uh, maturity years because you're not issuing as much debt, but because people want into this all in yield that still is juicy and they say, oh, I haven't seen nine, eight, nine percent in ages, I'll buy, I don't care about the spread, which is an interesting scenario because if you actually do see income issues and spreads do widen, what does that do for the performance of some of these areas or the risk on risk off signal? Because maybe all in the yields don't move that much because your base yield is going to come in as well if you were to see weakness in kind of a flight to safety, but it's it, it's been a wild supply demand dynamic that's eased a little bit to start this year. I mean, the supply has been taken down okay, but I think to your point, it's been all high grade stuff for the most part, uh, which suggests that you know there's still some trepidation for others to come to market. Well, the, the other thing that we're seeing on that front, just very quickly, and, and uh, John Archbold asked me a question, asked us a question about Verizon, right? So one of the things that's really interesting to me is the potential for fallen angels if we see any form of deterioration. You know, Verizon is one of these fascinating stories that looks to me a lot like the auto parts companies from the last cycle, right? So going into two, if you remember in 2005, we experienced an event in which the high yield index had a dramatic expansion of the number, the quantity of dollars that needed to be absorbed in as Ford and General Motors were downgraded, right? So they had been investment grade, the investment grade market is you know, roughly 10 times the size of the high yield market. If I think about a company like Verizon, they've got $40 billion coming due in the next 32 months with a weighted average interest expense. I think it's about 2%. The, their total, I was just going to ask you, like, guess what Verizon's weighted average coupon is for the entirety of its debt? I, I would guess two and a quarter. But, it's 3.4%, but right, that goes all off, the way out to 2050. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's right. I forgot they have some long dated issues, right? So this is one of the, this to me is one of the really interesting ones, particularly when I think about my behavior as a long-term Verizon cell phone user, former landline user from Verizon, I got nothing with them anymore, right? I went, I, I went for the cheap solution because T-Mobile offers me free, uh, you, you know, Wi-Fi on planes, which unfortunately I spend too much time on. Cameron, before the clock runs out, uh, because this is an investment podcast, where is your overweight and underweight? Stocks, bonds, gold, commodities, oil, fine art, housing, like wh wh what's the big idea? Where do you want to put the money? Fine art. I have, you can't see it, but I have a picture of Miss Piggy behind me. So um, <laughs> our clients have plenty of fine art. Uh, look, we are we're neutral overall in equities, but there's a lot of details within that. We are underweight small caps because of the low quality balance sheet dynamics. So we're overweight large caps quality large caps uh, for that matter. Um, if you look then within international, we are neutral, but we're underweight emerging markets, think it's a broken asset class um, and can get into a long debate as to whether or not it should be considered an asset class that has a home in every single person's allocation. Um, um, you can see that as existing is just kind of a leftover from the EM bubble of the 2000s. Uh, within fixed income, we still actually have an overweight to high yield. Um, we've been pairing it back slowly and surely over time. It's felt painful as we like pair it back and high yield keeps on rallying. Um, but that's something where you, we continue to, to look to say when we do have volatility, it'll be episodic. Uh, we are overweight, um, uh, sorry, we're underweight duration, um, you know, with this expectation that yields will move higher, but we're having a lot of uh, conversations about when we want to be moving to a bit more overweight um, or picking up and like locking in some higher yields. Uh, within the private markets, um, you, we it's selectivity across the board. We overweight private markets, underweight hedge funds at this point, but that actually is a key thing that we are uh, debating as to whether or not that needs to to flip given where we are uh, in the cycle. And so it's- it, Gold, oil, and Bitcoin. 
Um, gold, I think, is run really. We, we're neutral on risk on sorry on real assets, which would include all of those things. Uh, so it's run a lot. It's it's very crowded and sentiment is is stretched, which would suggest that you have some consolidation here. Um, oil, we don't take outright positions uh, in, but we um, you know, we have been looking at adding kind of broader commodity exposure. It's been one of those where it's it's not great for long term holds. So you got to get in right, got to get out right. It's a two decision, you know, can't, you know, no one to hold them, no one to fold them. Um, so it's usually not something that like the inflation hedges in portfolios haven't necessarily been great for the long long run portfolios. But we keep it about five percent. It's a slug, you know, small slug. Um, and then you know, on Bitcoin, you know, we see it as broadly a liquidity sensitive asset. And so you know, if liquidity is becoming more abundant as it has over the last let's call it 16 months, uh, then, you know, Bitcoin does well. Uh, if liquidity were to receive, it's high beta to the downside. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's, there's a the emotional aspect to it, which suggests that, you know, if you told me that the Treasury was going to continue to to print uh, um, significant uh, deficits at the same time as you would have banking fears, um, at the same time as liquidity is is supportive, at the same time that inflation uh, is running hotter than expected, um, but the Fed's still cut, talking about cutting rates, all of that seems to be supportive of an asset that benefits <laughs> from all of those those scenarios. Uh, but again, if liquidity were to turn in the opposite direction, you know, we would see it as, as particularly vulnerable. Mm -hmm. To me, the most interesting interesting thing right now, Harley, is, is that it appears to me we're coming out of this inflation episode with the same thing that we went into it. The used car component, the motor vehicle insurance and motor vehicle repairs, believe it or not, it accounted for, I think it's 50% of the total core inflation number that we actually saw from almost no components of the CPI baskets. Everything else actually seems to be doing reasonably well. It's housing, which we know is deeply lagged from OER. We just saw the Manhattan uh, rents retreat in an unexpected fashion. It, you know, we're, this not is going to be helping. an interesting point. Not, not helping Cameron, but um, but that's okay. Well, she, she's going to turn out this salesman for inflation. What's that? You are a used car salesman for inflation. Well, no, I'm trying to get people not to buy the inflation story. Don't buy the inflation story. It's broken, everyone. It's a lemon. All right, we're going to pass it over to Brent. Cameron, thank you so much for joining us. This was really a blast. It was great to see you again, as always. Harley, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Cameron, for joining us. Uh, Mike and Harley, great job, as always. Uh, remember out there, a uh, reminder to the audience out there to uh, register for next month's Keeping It Simple. That'll be on May 9th. Uh, we'll be discussing this special K-shaped economy. You can register at simplify.us, our website. We will have special guest, Professor Peter Atwater. He's the president of Financial Insights, which is a consulting firm that advises a variety of clientele on issues uh, impacting the financial services industry. So certainly another great discussion to come. We want to thank you all again for joining us today. Have a great rest of your afternoons and evenings, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time.